All right, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Welcome to the Q3 Advisory Risk Briefing, How to Reduce the Risk of Fraud in Your Organization. My name is Kristen Laporte. I'm with the Marketing Department, and I'm just gonna walk through a couple of housekeeping items before we kick this off. To qualify for CPE, actively respond to all the polling questions and stay on for the duration of the broadcast. If you have any technical difficulties responding to the polling questions, please shoot us an email with the name and date of your session along with your responses and we will get that fixed. I will also put this in the chat where you can also put in your questions. We will get to your questions if time permits. Anything we cannot answer, we will follow up after the webinar. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ron Steinkamp and Patrick Chalinski to introduce themselves and start the webinar. Great, thank you very much, Kristen. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country. Um, we appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. My name is Ron Steinkamp. Uh, I'm a partner in the Risk, Risk and Assurance and Advisory Services Group uh, at Arbonino. Uh, I have been uh, performing internal audits, fraud and prevention and detection services, consulting services for over 30 years now. Um, with that, I'm going to turn over to Patrick to introduce himself. Thanks, Ron. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending. Uh, my name is Patrick Chalinski. I've got 25 years of professional experience and I head up uh, Armanino's fraud investigation, forensic accounting and litigation consulting practice. And so I've worked with private sector, public sector clients doing hundreds of different types of forensic and fraud investigations. And Ron tends to focus a little bit more on risk assessment and prevention. I tend to focus a little bit more on investigations after the fact, but but again, we sort of overlap in, in the whole fraud and forensic space. But again, uh, thanks for joining today and I'll turn it back to you, Ron. Thanks, Patrick. So with that, let's get into our learning objectives. So uh, you can see those on the screen. Number one, we wanna identify occupational fraud and schemes. Talk a little bit about that. We're gonna review some of the findings on fraud that came from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners report to the nation. They produce this report every couple of years. The last one uh, was for 2020, which was released in, I think, early 2021. So we should have another one coming out soon. Uh, we're going to summarize some keys to fraud prevention and detection and discuss some fraud war, war stories. And Patrick's really going to get into the uh, uh, some details on how to conduct that investigation. So with that, let's jump right in. So some questions I'd like you all to consider as we go through this as we start through the presentation, um, do you know where fraud could occur in your organization? It's a question I think you need to ask yourself from time to time. Um, if you have responsibility uh, for controls, for processes within your organization, you need to think about where could fraud could occur? What's your risk? What's the risk of fraud in your organization? Do you have adequate policies, procedures, controls, processes in place that are designed to prevent and detect fraud? before it happens, or at least early, so you can prevent your losses or at least lessen your losses. And that's something we talk about a lot. You know, as, as Patrick mentioned, my focus is really on the fraud preventative and, and detective side of the house, you know, and how we can conduct a risk assessment and how we can look to see where fraud could occur. And then have we assessed or reassessed our policies because of COVID-19? COVID-19 changed a lot of things in our lives, both at work and at home. You know, your, your work may now be at home. You may be processing invoices uh, for payment at home. You know, what controls, what processes, what pre procedures have changed because of that? So I think policies need to be reassessed. So we'll talk about that. So let's get into some occupational fraud categories and schemes. And what we do is we go to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the ACFE, uh, for their definition. And basically occupational fraud is the use of a person's occupation, a personal enrichment through deliberate misuse or application of the employee organization's resources or assets. Really three general categories there. Asset misappropriation is where an employee steals or misuses an organization's resources. Those could be dollars, they could be time, they could be inventory, uh, could be equipment. So a lot of things to think about there, I think, Typically, when we think asset misappropriation, we're thinking dollars, but it's not always dollars. Corruption. I do a lot of work in the government space, and, and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of this, but 
Uh, it's where an employee uses their influence in business transaction in a way that violates duty to the employer for the purpose of obtaining benefit for themselves or someone else. So think about some of the stories you see in the news, a lot that make the news. It's all it's it's about corruption. You, you know, it's about folks who, who may be getting a bribe or a kickback uh, to send business a certain direction. Financial statement fraud, that's uh, the intentional misstatement or omission of material information in the organization's financial reports. So basically cooking the books. And Ron, I'll, I'll just add, uh, yeah. so the ACFE report to the nations is really focused on occupational fraud. And Ron mentioned that's really internal. So that's employees or executives that may have uh, maybe committing some sort of financial fraud scheme, but there's obviously other types of fraud. So we, we sort of look at this as internal or occupational fraud or potentially external. So a third party, a customer or a vendor can also commit fraud against an organization. But as Ron walks through some of these detailed slides, keep in mind that this is really an occupational fraud survey, uh, but there are also other types of fraud as well. You're definitely correct on that, Patrick. And one that we're seeing a lot of lately, and it's a whole nother session, but it's cybersecurity, right? And, and from a cyber perspective. So uh, something definitely to keep in mind. Um, this next chart, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. This is one I encourage you. If you're going to do a fraud risk assessment, this is a great one pager to have in front of you, right? To take a look and see, okay, from a corruption perspective, what are some of the schemes and think about, could they occur here? Could they occur in my organization? Same with asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud. So, you know, if there's one, one part of this presentation you're going to take, pin up in your office, use for future resources, I think this is a good starting point for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about some fraud stories. I'm going to go fairly quickly through a couple, and then Patrick's going to elaborate on a couple of his as well. Um, first one here is director of procurement. Um, basically took about $1.3 million of services that were never provided by her company by falsified records. So director of procurement was able to get her company approved. Uh, I think it was to provide uh, computer services, IT services to the company that she worked for. So she had her company on the side. Uh, she was able to get them approved as, an, approved as a vendor and was able to get invoices paid by falsifying records, essentially approving those invoices herself. Uh, so again, these are some of the things that can happen out there. Another one that I've seen is a CEO of a nonprofit focused on at-risk children from low-income households. They were receiving some federal money, some federal grant dollars. Um, the CEO electronically submitted fraudulent claims over $250,000 worth for reimbursement based on inflated attendance figures. So, you know, maybe they had 10 children that they they, they were working with and, and she, the CEO would have, would have submitted, hey, we, we work with 50 and they get reimbursed based on that. So, you know, we see fraud in various aspects and, and this is definitely one that, uh, you know, anytime you, you're defrauding the federal government, it's a serious matter. So, uh, Patrick, you wanna talk a little bit about a couple of years? Sure, just a couple uh, examples or war stories from some of the projects that I've worked on in the past. So the first one is a misuse of fee program dollars. So this is in the public sector. And I know we have a lot of folks from uh, different government entities and agencies on the call today. So uh, this was a, a large multi-jurisdictional uh, fee program. And one of the participants uh, was diverting those funds for uh, their particular entity, as well as uh, themselves. And so this was a multi-billion dollar, multi-year fee program. And we got involved in reviewing uh, voluminous documentation. And some of, the, some of the issues and some of the takeaways that I'll um, uh, give some insight on are, are really, a lot of this comes down to reporting, timely reporting, accurate reporting. And so when we get called in to do some of this investigative work, we look for uh, whether or not that reporting exists, uh, when it was provided, if we see any anomalies or missing information or changing information and those sorts of things. So it was a quite, quite a large investigation. And as you can see on the screen there, quite a large dollar amount. And the last item on the list is we've done a lot of nonprofit sector uh, related work. So this is really a compilation of uh, many, many projects that I've worked on in the past, fraud investigations, forensic investigations. And so 
Uh, nonprofits oftentimes have somewhat of uh, a lack of resources when it comes to finance and accounting functions. And so we oftentimes see issues around uh, updating policies and procedures, veri verifying compliance with those internal policies and procedures. Another issue that often comes into play is the funding, which can create various layers of reporting requirements, um, regulatory requirements, so whether it's state funding or federal funding. And so we look at this in a multi-layered approach. So we look at policies and procedures. We look at uh, federal regulations, IRS codes that may be applicable. And so we often see these types of issues in uh, the investigations uh, related to nonprofits. And so, uh, again, I noticed there are a lot of uh, nonprofit uh, related folks on the call today. So I wanted to make sure we talk about this a bit because this is a big issue, something we see quite often. Thanks, Patrick. And there's a lot of great stories out there. I'm sure you, you, know, you folks see them every day. Right, but I, I would encourage you, you know, if you really want to see, you know, a good fraud story, um, city of Dixon, Illinois, Rita Crudwell committed a over $50 million fraud there. There is a documentary out called All the Queen's Horses, and I always encourage folks, take a look at that, you know, because it really dissects the fraud and how it happened and how it was allowed to happen, how people knew something might be going on and didn't say anything. It talks a lot about the warning signs, so interesting documentary. Um, with that, I think we have our first uh, polling question, Kristen. Hey, it's not launching, Ron. Okay. okay. Anything I need to do on my end, Kristen? Um, why don't you see if you can hit polls and launch it? It's getting a host error. Okay. Ron, while you're looking for that, I see a question that popped up about hints or clues. So that's a really good question. Absolutely. And, and one thing I always talk about is being keeping uh, fraud and fraud risk top of mind. And so thinking about whether or not you're getting timely reporting and accurate reporting and whether or not information continues to change over time when you ask for more information. So those are a few of the things that I would recommend. Um, and we should have a polling question, but it looks like we may have a little bit of a technical. Yeah, issue. I think we're having a technical issue with that. Um, yeah, it won't launch. It won't launch. No. Well, that's not good. Um, okay. Well, I tell you what, um, Kristen, with your approval, I know we, we're not going to get everybody's, um, we're not going to see everybody's participation, but I can, I can read the question if, if that, if you want to read the question and they can chat me the answer, I'll log it. Okay, great. All right, so our first polling question is, which category of occupational fraud causes you the most concern in your organization? And this is a multiple choice answer. You can check all that apply. It's A, asset misappropriation, B, corruption, C, financial statement fraud, or D, none of the above. So if you just chat, Kristen, um, with, with your answer, A, B, C, or D. It's working. Thank you. Okay. And Kristen, still you, coming let, in. you let me know when I should move on. Okay. They're coming in fast. I think you can go ahead and move on and they can continue to answer. Great. Apologize for the uh, technical error, folks. We'll do the best we can on this. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about some of the findings from the ACFE's report to the nation on occupational fraud and abuse. And, and again, to Patrick's point, you know, these are kind of the internal frauds that happen, right? The frauds that, you know, your employees, your, your management, uh, those of you, I know we've got some from, from some municipalities and from government, your elected officials. These are the frauds that, that could occur uh, with those folks. So first of all, just some really key findings here. And this is one that's been consistent. You know, they've done this uh, fraud study for many, many years. This has been a consistent statistic. It's estimated organizations lose 5% of their annual revenue to fraud. So think about that from your perspective. 
um, you know, if you were to lose 5% of your annual revenue, or if you're a governmental or a nonprofit organization, your budget, 5% of your budget to fraud every year, how would that impact you? Um, asset misappropriation was the most common category that occurred in the study. It occurred in 86% of the cases, meaning loss about 100,000. Financial statement fraud was the least common. The cost the most with a median loss about 954,000. And again, financial statement fraud happens at a very high level within an organization uh, with folks who have access to uh, large amounts of, uh, well, have access basically to, to cook the books, let's put it that way. So uh, that's why you see the larger losses. On average, fraud lasts about 14 months. Uh, fraud itself, occupational fraud, is most likely detected by tips uh, at 43%. We'll talk some more about that in a bit and get some more detail on that. But half of those come from employees. That's why we think it's important that you have a system for those employees to report fraud when they see it. Uh, fraud perpetrators often display some warning signs. We're going to talk about those. Uh, then organizations that have implemented anti-fraud controls have realized lower fraud losses. Uh, ACFE has an interesting graphic we'll show you in a bit that kind of shows, you know, if, if you implemented this uh, particular anti-fraud control, here's the losses on average that we saw. And if you didn't, those losses go up. So we'll show that in a bit. And then data monitoring analysis, surprise audits were correlated with the largest reduction in fraud loss. So those of you who aren't using data analysis, data monitoring, I definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Um, you know, I've, we've always said it's the future, but it's really, it's now, right? It's, it's, it's what folks need to really take a look at and use for a monitoring perspective. And Ron, right. Yeah, Ron, yeah. I'll just add quickly, the, the takeaway for me in, in, in doing this for a living, this is my area of, of focus and expertise, uh, really fraud and fraud risk and prevention, it's really a multi-layered approach. And uh, some of the key takeaways from my mind are to make sure that you have, a, as, as the previous slide indicated, a, a system and policies and procedures in place. And the longer fraud takes place, the longer the duration, typically the larger the loss. So the quicker you can Number one, if you can prevent it, that's that's even better. But if you can't prevent it, you can identify it quickly. You typically lower the uh, the loss. So those are some key takeaways from my perspective. Definitely, and and good points, Patrick. And we'll talk some more about each of those points. This slide, I just really want to kind of flash up here, and, and I, I believe the presentation will be available to everybody. But you know, based on what organization or what industry you're in, you could see how fraud from the from the surveys perspective has impacted that industry. And we'll just look at uh, the first one there is agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting, median losses of $100,000. Uh, they had 40 cases. So uh, again, I think we've got a lot of you here from uh, from government. If you look at the, uh, oh, the second row, um, government public administration, median loss of 100,000 with 195 cases. So again, something for you to look at and based on your industry, you can see uh, from the study what they saw from a loss perspective. Um, this chart I know is a little bit busy, but again, it goes by industry and really shows you the number of cases that were reported in the study to the ACFE, along with the, the percentage or the particular fraud scheme. So a lot of these you'll see the red, reddish, the brighter orange is in the corruption category. So a lot of industries seeing fraud um, uh, more prevalent within corrupt with corruption than, than they are with anything else. So uh, something to keep in mind. How's occupational fraud committed? Again, we talked about this a bit at the beginning, but you can see asset misappropriations occurring the most with meaning loss of $100,000, followed by corruption, and then financial statement fraud. But those financial statement fraud losses are, are very high at 954000 so how long does each scheme last? We told you on average, uh, the median at least was 14 months, but you can see there are some schemes that last a lot longer, payroll schemes, check and payment tampering. Uh, if you have cash registers, register disbursement issues, financial statement fraud, expense reimbursements, billing, all at 24 months. And then you'll see it goes down from there. 
And Ron, if you think about it, you know, this is a year or two that these are ongoing, which is really a significant amount of time. You've gone through many quarters, uh, many, many fiscal years or calendar years. I mean, two years for a fraud scheme to be ongoing is, when you think about it, is quite significant. So I mentioned before, preventing potential fraud and then identifying it as quickly as possible are really keys to, to limiting the losses. But this, this slide to me is really powerful when you think about a, a fraud yeah. scheme going on for two or three years. It's, it's a quite a long period of time. And Patrick, that is a really great segue to the next slide. Um, you're looking at the duration of fraud and how it relates to median loss. You can see that, you know, as you go up or as you go over in this chart, you know, if it's under six months, uh, median loss is about uh, 50,000. Uh, if you go all the way to the end, if it's over 60 months, uh, so that's a pretty long fraud. But uh, there are those that occur, and the median loss there is seven hundred forty thousand. So again, to Patrick's point, the longer the fraud goes on, the more you're going to see in losses. So again, I, our goal is to try to prevent fraud, but we can never prevent one hundred percent of the fraud, right? We we it'd be too expensive for us to put those controls in place. The fraudsters would still find a way around that. So what we want to do is we want to prevent as much as we can. But the fraud that does occur, we want to try to detect it as soon as we can so we can lessen those losses. Okay. Um, so how is occupational fraud detected? So we talked a little bit about this tip by far, you know, 43%. Um, so I it's, it's critical that you have a mechanism, a process in place. You know, we said your employees accounted for 50% of that. Uh, it's, it's critical you have process in place for your employees, uh, the vendors you work with, um, the clients you work with, or the citizens, for those of you who are in the public sector, can report if they see something that looks wrong. So TIP is then followed by internal audit. Uh, I encourage everybody, you know, if you have an internal audit function, hopefully they're focused on fraud prevention and detection. Uh, if not, uh, they need to be. Um, it, it, it's one of the big risks that, that they should be focused on. Management review comes next. What really concerns me, and, and I hear this a lot because I do work with a lot of government and we'll talk about fraud and fraud prevention and detection. They'll say, hey, we have an audit every year, right? I don't need to worry about that because my auditors are focused on fraud. Well, if you look down there, your external audit catches 4% of the frauds. Um, now, again, that's nothing against those auditors. They have a materiality threshold and they're really focused on those financial statements. The hope is they're gonna catch the financial statement fraud, but if you've got asset misappropriation or corruption going on, it's gonna be difficult for them to catch that. So again, you know, the message here is don't over rely on your external audit because they're not gonna catch all fraud. There are definitely other things that you need to do. Okay. So Ron, one thing I'll mention on this slide is some of these things are processes that can be put in place. So IT controls that, that monitor transactions and uh, internal audit and those sorts of things. But uh, TIPS, which is the largest percentage by far here, you're really relying on your employees or third parties that have connections or relationships with the company to come forward and let you know that something may be amiss. And so one thing we often talk about is tone at the top, having written policies and procedures, having a, a fraud hotline and those sorts of things. So people are aware that your company, your organization has uh, zero tolerance for um, inappropriate activity and that you encourage people to come forward because again, a tip is an employee or someone that's connected to your company coming forward and letting you know that something may be amiss. And so you're relying on, on on their actions. And so you wanna make sure that they know how to come forward and that you encourage them to come forward. So again, I, I mentioned before, fraud prevention and mitigation is really multi-layered. One of the key issues is tone at the top and having a, a mechanism or a way for people to come forward and let you know what's going on. Right, and key to that too, Patrick, I agree with you hundred percent, but it's having that tool, but it's educating your employees on that tool as well in that process. Um, you know, it's one thing, and I've seen a lot of, a lot of my clients, you know, they say, hey, we've got this fraud policy, uh, 
well, have have you communicated to the employees? Have you trained them on this? And I, I will tell you quite a bit. We find out no, they haven't. So it's important that you know you have that policy, you had the process in place, but that you're communicating and training folks on it. So who reports occupational fraud again? Talked about this. Your employees, fifty percent followed by your customers. Um, you're gonna have some of those folks who choose to remain anonymous and then vendors. And you're either gonna find, even gonna find some competitors that might report. So um, it, it's critical that there are vehicles, there are processes in place for these folks to be able to report. Um, how does detection relate to loss? So, you know, if you look at the very top of this chart, um, if the police come in, the FBI, whoever it might be, and say, hey, you've got a fraud, it's pretty pretty good bet that it's gone on for a while. You know, the medium duration there is 24 months and the losses of 900,000. So um, definitely, you know, and as you move down, you're getting more active type detection methods. So, you know, passive at the top, active at the bottom. And you can see at the very bottom with surveillance and monitoring, um, your median losses are going to be a lot less uh, as well as duration. So you can see, you know, that um, definitely how you go about detecting that fraud relates to how much you're going to lose. And you want to be more active with making sure you're doing your account reconciliations, making sure you've got good IT controls in place, you've got an internal audit function. You've got a, a hotline in place so people can report tips. Ron, someone had a question about third-party uh, fraud hotlines and tip lines. So one thing I'll mention is the ACFE website has a lot of information that's available uh, just to anyone that logs into that website uh, around data and fraud hotlines and those sorts of things. So uh, my suggestion would be that um, whether it's an internal hotline or you're using a third-party vendor to do that, having that's really important. And again, the ACFE website has resources that may be helpful. And then feel free to reach out to Ron or myself uh, after this call, and we could also uh, discuss any particular questions you may have. Definitely, the ACFE is a great resource. Okay, so our next uh, slide here talks about the presence of anti-fraud controls and how they relate to meeting losses. So brought this up earlier, You know, there are some anti-fraud controls out there that really help reduce your median losses. So I know this chart is very busy. Let's, uh, you know, if you look at the far right hand side of it, um, let's just look at the controls. You know, first one there is code of conduct. Um, the, if the controls in place, what the ACFE found was the median loss was $100,000. If it's not in place, it's 205,000. So by having that control in place, you're reducing your loss by 50%. Going down the chart, internal audit department, same thing. You're reducing your loss by 50% by having one in place. Um, and you could, everybody else can read along down the slide to see, you know, that really having these controls in place, making sure you have some good anti fraud controls, a policy, you know, management reviews, you know, a hotline, it's going to reduce your loss if and when a fraud does occur. Okay. So what are some of the behavioral red flags? So this is a good indicator of, of what to look for. I will tell you that just because, you know, one of your employees might exhibit one of these red flags doesn't necessarily mean that they're committing fraud, but it's something to be aware of. Number one is living beyond their means, right? So, you know, we had an incident here uh, locally uh, with county government, where we had a county employee who was making $80,000 a year, living in a $3 million house, driving nice cars, you know, basically living beyond their means. Well, that employee was able to set up a uh, fake vendor scheme and get paid by the county uh, for services not provided. Uh, and that's where that money was coming from the, to basically uh, help him with that lifestyle. Others, financial difficulties, um, unusually close association with vendor or customer, uh, 
like they're going out to lunch, you know, they're they're hanging out, they're doing different things. It could be an indication that maybe, you know, maybe something's going on there, especially if it's somebody in your purchasing department. Um, what's scary to me is no behavioral red flags. So, you know, those folks that, hey, there was nothing that looked off. So that was 15%. So again, I'm not going to go through the full list. Um, it will be there in the slide deck uh, for you to take a look at. But things to keep in mind, again, it, it's not to say that if you see one of these, you're going to go on and, and look, you know, point fingers at folks and cast aspersions, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and to look for, okay? And Ron, the red flags are, are you know, so, somewhat self-explanatory, but they're not necessarily uh, proof that fraud is taking place or a particular individual is committing, uh, potentially committing fraud. But if you start to see some of these things, uh, some of these behaviors, um, you know, it's something to pay attention to. I always say uh, being aware uh, that fraud, unfortunately, is evergreen, meaning it, it's never going to go away. So our goal, our job is to be aware of it, put processes and controls in place to mitigate it and identify it if it's taking place. And so these are the, the last slide was some of those red flags that things to keep in mind, things to keep watch for. And if you see those, then it could be an indicator that you need to look a little bit deeper and do some additional uh, analysis or investigation. Definitely. And I've had incidents where we've been called in and, and, and we weren't the first firm called in. There's one, another firm called in before and they, you know, they would say, hey, we see all these signs. We think this person is committing fraud. The first firm didn't find anything. And we looked at it and we didn't find anything either. Right. So you want to be careful with this. Uh, Patrick's absolutely correct. So the next slide talks about the fraud triangle. And, and we take a look at this from the perspective of you know, there really needs to be three things kind of in place here for, for a fraud, fraudster to, uh, to commit fraud. Um, first of all, there's got to be some kind of pressure. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, I use this example because I've seen this in my career. It's, it's a grandmother with a sick grandchild, right? Um, and, and this grandchild needs medical treatments. So there's a pressure there. Uh, there's a rationalization, you know, hey, I'm going to pay it back. I'm just going to borrow a little bit um, and I will pay it back. And they really do owe me because I haven't had a raise in years, right? And then there's an opportunity. So we've put this person in the position where maybe there isn't management oversight. There aren't great controls in place. Maybe segregation of duties um, isn't good. You know, they're able to get access or do things within the system, Um you know, take money out of the cash drawer, whatever it might be. So pressure and rationalization are hard things for us to really focus on as organizations, but where we can focus is on that opportunity and limiting those opportunities by making sure we've got good controls in place. All right. Okay, so um, there's really been some challenges, you know, as we talk about living in the COVID world, basically, um, this slide deals with what are the most prominent challenges in com combating fraud in the wake of, of the pandemic or COVID-19. You know, and we've seen a lot of changes. I'm sure you've all experienced a lot of changes in the way you do your job. But, um, you know, really, you know, it's the inability to travel here. And, and these are all slides that, you know, ACFE does a very good job of, of getting things out. And, and this came from their benchmarking report. Um, you know, investigations, you know, from a fraud perspective, it, it, you know, when, when you're sitting at home, um, it's harder to do an investigation. Uh, you really need to be out there in the field. Uh, lack of access to evidence has, has been a big challenge in combating fraud. So, you know, again, we've all been in our homes. Yeah, I think we figured out great ways to work remotely, but there are still some challenges here that have been caused by COVID. Um, technology challenges is on there. That's one I think we've all seen. Uh, delays in communication. Uh, how do we maintain privacy over the data when it's coming to our home system? So again, a lot, basically just a list of challenges uh, in combating fraud during COVID. Um, how does COVID-19 affect fraud? Uh, so Basically, this was some results 
as of as of May 2020. So there was a 25% or at least a significant increase of 25% uh, of fraud as of May 2020. And what they're projecting or expected over the 20, next 12 months is that's going to increase another 50%. So you can see that you know, COVID-19 has had an effect on fraud. It is occurring. Um, again, in a lot of cases, we've had to bypass some controls so folks can work at home. And anytime we do that, we really open ourselves up to fraud. So something to be aware of and think about how has your how have your business processes changed since COVID-19? And where could there be more um, likelihood that fraud could occur? Okay. And Ron, uh, just to put a finer point on this, if you think about the fraud triangle, when uh, COVID hit, everyone ended up working remotely uh, for a period of time or continues to work remotely. In a sense, that gives a little bit more opportunity or a lot more opportunity for uh, controls to be circumvented or to be reduced uh, just because we've had to adjust to the COVID environment. And so um, uh, also monitoring. So when people are in an office, it may be easier to keep track of assets and keep track of work performance and those sorts of things. Whereas if everyone's working remotely, there's again, some more opportunity for oversight and um, uh, review uh, on an onsite basis wouldn't be taking place at the same level. So. Right. Well, we're gonna, let's see if we can launch this one. Well, that didn't work, sorry. Um, let me go back guys, I apologize. Kristen, have you had any luck? I don't, I I'm unfortunately have a technical error and can't do that. So I will put it in the chat and if everyone can just reply to the panelists with their answers, we are able to log what you send. Okay, should I read the question? Yes, go ahead and read the question. It's out on chat as well. Great. All right, so polling question two, what method or methods of detection is your organization using to detect occupational fraud? Again, you can select all that apply. A, internal audit, B, external audit, C, tip hotline, D, management review, or E, none. The answers are coming in. Everyone can keep answering if you want to continue, Ron. Okay, great, terrific, thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on and talk about some keys to fraud prevention and detection. And I think we've hit on a lot of these as we've gone through, and I think Patrick's brought a lot of these up as well um, with his comments, but you know, establishing a good fraud governance program, uh, it really is that tone at the top. It's making sure we've got that organizational commitment to fraud risk management making sure we're establishing a comprehensive policy related to fraud risk management, that we've established roles and responsibilities. So if fraud occurs or somebody thinks there's fraud, who should it be reported to? Who's gonna do the investigation? You know, what are the roles, what are the responsibilities? We're gonna make sure we document that fraud risk management program. We communicate fraud risk our fraud governance and what we're doing to all our organizational levels. And then we train those folks. Again, it's, it's one thing to have a policy, but we got to make sure folks are aware of that policy and know who to go to and, and who they should be talking to or reporting potential fraud to and implementing a fraud hotline. So again, it's critical, you know, that uh, we have a process in place for folks to report fraud. Conducting a fraud risk assessment. Now, this is one thing that, you know, I'm very passionate about, and I think every organization needs to do it. And we need to look at every level of the organization. We need to look at every department, division, uh, operating unit um, to figure out where, where could fraud happen within our organization? Um, what's the likelihood? What could be the extent of that fraud or significance of it from a dollar perspective? from a reputational perspective. There's a lot to think about there, but what types of schemes could occur in our organization? There are various ways to conduct a fraud risk assessment. Again, that's a whole nother session, but you know, you could do interviews, you could have a survey tool, a questionnaire that you get out to folks. Um, you need to consider where could people override the controls within your organization. And it's one thing, you know, you got to take it a step further, right? If you determine where fraud can occur in your organization, 
and the likelihood of significance? Where are the controls to help prevent or detect that fraud? Uh, can you identify those? You know, if you've got those controls in place, hopefully that mitigates some of the risk. If not, we need to think about what controls need to be put in place. So I think it's critical that you conduct a fraud risk assessment. Um, I usually recommend annually. Um, it doesn't it, you know, have to be as thorough every year. Maybe it's just updating last year's. Uh, but I, I would say thorough every couple of years, you know, take a good look because fraud does change. Uh, the schemes change over time. All right, our next polling question. So we're going to these polling questions quick now. Um, I'm going to put it in chat. Okay, you tell me when you're ready. Go ahead. All right. When is the last time your organization has conducted a fraud risk assessment? A, within the last year. B, over a year ago, C, more than two years ago, D, I'm not sure, and E, we never have. So for those of you who are not sure, I would definitely find out. Um, you know, that's one thing I'd want to find out about the organization. And for those who never have, I think it's, it's probably time um, that you sit down and, and conduct a fraud risk assessment or get some help to do that. So you know where your risks are. All right, Kristen, I'll wait for you to tell me to move on. I, answers are still coming in. They're all over the place, but I think it's good for you to move on. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. All right, number three is really implementing a good fraud prevention and detection program. You know, what, what controls, what can we put in place to promote fraud deterrence? Um, whether it be a preventative or detective control type activity. Again, we need to think through that. The risk assessment's really going to give us the key, you know, as we look at that, where fraud could occur, or maybe where we've got some control gaps, or we need to improve the design of our controls. So thinking through that, where we could put some good controls in place to make sure we're preventing and detecting um, a fraud as soon as possible. Um, again, I mentioned that integrated with the fraud risk assessment. Um, every business is a little bit different. Every organization is a little bit different. Think about it from your perspective. This isn't is cookie cutter, right? So, you know, depending on what business you're in, you might have some different fraud risk. Uh, consider the application to control activities at different levels of the organization, right? So it's not just, you, you, you know, down at the, uh, the lower levels. It's prevalent throughout your organization that you've got control activities. Use a combination, some preventative controls, make sure you've got good segregation of duties, limited system access, detected controls such as bank reconciliations. This is one that, you know, I've seen a lot of my clients and, and they'll tell me they do bank reconciliations. So I'll ask for them and it's been nine months since they've done one. It's critical that you do those bank reconciliations. Surprise cash counts. Human resources, make sure we're doing as good of background checks and investigations as we possibly can. I know sometimes that's difficult, um, given that um, you know there's there's not a lot of information out there sometimes on on folks or information we can get from former employers. But do what we can. We can do some social media checks um, to see uh, what's going on. You know, do some court checks uh, to see if 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 they there's been a crime committed. But whatever we can do to use a combination of controls and then. Also, where can management override controls? That means they have spe you know, special consideration. We need to think about that. And back to data analytics, how can we use them to be more proactive to find out where there might be an issue before it turns into a major issue? Um, and then make sure we've got those controls within our policies and procedures. Conducting fraud investigations, taking corrective action, I'm really going to, you know, Patrick's going to talk a bit about this, but, you know, I'd encourage you all, you know, when, when, when you do have something that happens, do that investigation, bring somebody in who knows how to do it and make sure that, you know, that, that, that they've done it before um, because there are a lot of folks, there are a lot of illegal issues here that need to be dealt with uh, to make sure you have a professional. So I'll leave the rest to Patrick on that. Uh, then monitor your fraud risk management. So make sure that you're taking a look at what you're doing uh, regularly. So from a fraud perspective, fraud risk management perspective, uh, 
Um, are you doing proper evaluations? You know, take a look at how your investigative process is working. Take a look at how your fraud risk assessment process is working. Um, so it's important that you look at those from time to time. All right, we're up to uh, our polling question number four. Kristen, can I go ahead and read that? Go ahead and read it and I will put this in chat as well. Last okay. one. So what keys to fraud prevention and detection do you believe your organization needs to focus more attention on? Select all that apply. A, establish a fraud risk governance program. B, conduct a fraud risk assessment. C, implement fraud prevention and detection. D, conduct fraud investigations and take corrective action. Or E, monitor fraud risk management. All right, as they continue coming in, I think you can keep talking. And thank you, everyone, for your patience on this. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We, we do appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. And Patrick's going to talk about uh, investigations. Thanks, Ron. So I know a lot of the uh, participants uh, today have uh, uh, some experience, maybe a lot of experience in doing investigations. I know there's some CFEs on the call, some uh, investigative folks. So some of this may be somewhat straightforward and basic. But what we wanted to do today is when we talked about some of the fraud schemes and, and controls and, and ways to detect fraud and mitigate fraud, we also wanted to provide the framework of how we typically conduct a fraud or forensic investigation. So, uh, so uh, people oftentimes ask, well, what is forensic accounting or what is a forensic investigation? So a working um, definition of forensic analysis or forensic investigation is reviewing documents and information and conducting interviews and quantifying or, or arriving at a result in a way that's presentable in a courtroom. That's a general working definition of forensic analysis or forensic investigations. And a fraud investigation would really be, in a sense, a subset of that forensic accounting or forensic investigation umbrella. And it's very focused on potential fraud. And one thing I'll point out is we've used the word or the phrase potential fraud. Uh, ultimately, it's up to a court to decide whether or not someone has really uh, or someone has actually committed fraud. So as fraud investigators, we look for indicia or indicators, and we look for data, and we look for patterns, and we look for anomalies, and we assess and analyze and quantify that information. But ultimately, whether or not someone intended to commit fraud is a key issue. And again, it's up to the court to decide that. So we talk about potential fraud or indicators of fraud. So again, if, uh, if you're a CFE or, or a, a auditor, uh, investigator, this may be fairly straightforward, but if you're a business owner or an executive or work at a government entity and have not really been involved in the nuts and bolts of a fraud or forensic investigation, this will give you a framework as to how we approach this. And it could be informative in terms of uh, how you look at potentially hiring a, an outside firm to come in and, and do an investigation. So. We'll touch on some of the key points. So uh, again, when we start uh, the process, we get contacted by a potential client. We want to start to assess the situation and, and what are we dealing with? What are the key issues? So we, we, we uh, ask some uh, high gain questions about, you know, what uh, red flags have you seen? What information have you looked at? Oftentimes clients may have already done an internal investigation or some analysis on their own. And so we wanna make sure we understand what the issues are. Uh, some of the questions we'll ask, who do you think may be involved? And that doesn't necessarily mean that is actually who is involved. It's, it's a starting point. And so as we progress through the investigation and review documents and information and conduct interviews, we may determine that other people were involved or people that may have been suspected to be involved weren't, but that's part of the process. Uh, what is the time period in question? This is a question we, we ask on the onset, is this something that you think may have been going on for a few months or a few years, or is it undetermined at this point? But again, we're trying to frame out what our process is going to look like, what our project plan is going to look like. And so these are framing questions that we ask and information that we look to get uh, on the onset. And then what document documents and information are available. So Everything uh, you can imagine, uh, 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 audits, financial statements, tax returns, um, uh, monthly, quarterly reporting, uh, accounting data, those sorts of things. So we want to assess what is available. What are we going to be looking at? What are we going to analyze? And so 
again, establishing this framework framework is really key. And as I mentioned here, things change over time. So as we get into the analysis and, and start to look at data and documents, we may change course based on what we see. So from a sort of a nuts and bolts project management project process perspective, um, you know, we would establish our approach and our team. So again, the last slide talked about some of those questions we would ask and we'd start to frame out what we're going to look at, uh, what we think the look back period is, what documents we would request. And so that's part of the approach. And then we, we uh, form the team that we think is most um, appropriate to work on the project. And so um, a couple of things that we typically do is run a conflict check. So as a, an accounting consulting firm, we want to ensure that we're, we don't have any independence issues or business conflicts. And so that's a typical process. We would have an engagement letter, engagement contract in place that would lay out the rates that we were gonna charge and it may have a fee range estimate and that sort of thing. I'll point out also that oftentimes we're engaged through counsel. And so we often are engaged through the law firm or the attorney uh, working on behalf of a client. Uh, other times we may be directly engaged by uh, the board of directors or a special committee to the board or a business owner, that sort of thing. So again, it would be fact and situation specific. Then we talked about putting the project plan in place. And then again, we would form our engagement team and touching on something we mentioned before in the COVID environment, um, you know, working from home, working remotely, having some of the restrictions in place. Historically, we oftentimes, and I would say most often do site visits or go out and meet with people in their place of business. And obviously during the COVID era, that changed a bit, although things are, are loosening up uh, a bit. Uh, again, we all know that we're still in, still in a little bit of a state of flux here. And so the engagement team and project plan have to be tailored to the facts and situation and also keeping in mind our, some of the restrictions that exist today around COVID. So in terms of investigative steps, uh, again, some of this may seem straightforward, but we like to approach this with, with a very structured process, a very structured format. And again, these are generally accepted uh, forensic accounting fraud investigation steps that most, uh, most firms would follow. Uh, and it gives us that framework by which we would then um, go forward. And as Ron mentioned, we may change uh, course as we get into the information and conduct interviews or we may pivot, but again, we wanna make sure we have a really solid foundation as we, as we begin the process. So one of the first things we would do after an initial intake call with the client, getting an engagement letter in place is uh, providing a document and information request list. And so those are the things that based on our understanding of the situation and our experience in similar matters, those, those are the information and documents that we think we would, uh, would be necessary for us to do the, do the investigation. And oftentimes it turns out that not everything we would request is available. There may be missing information and that can be part of the problem as well. So if we are asking for in information that we would typically expect to see and it doesn't exist, or we request information and we get multiple versions, those may be indicators that, um, what we're looking at, uh, there may be problems with, with uh, the situation. We talked about working on site or remotely. Oftentimes we'll do what I call desktop analysis. So we may get information from the client and we may do a fair amount or a significant amount of analytics um, in our office remotely. Um, but oftentimes we historically would work on site or conduct site visits, uh, go out on site to conduct interviews and those sorts of things. And again, um, in the COVID environment, there are some restrictions to that. But again, this is a more of a general overview of how we typically um, conduct our uh, analysis. We, we request that the client provides us a key contact. People most knowledgeable of the situation can help guide us through the document procurement process and answer questions that we may have, point us in the right direction if we want to interview people that are most knowledgeable about a particular aspect of our investigation. Confidentiality is key. Um, as I mentioned before, oftentimes we're engaged through counsel, um, uh, uh, fraud investigations, forensic investigations oftentimes have a very uh, strict um, confidentiality aspect to them. I would say most often they do. And so our work would be conducted with the uh, utmost in terms of co confidentiality, in terms of disclosing 
uh, information about who we may be looking to interview or potential findings and those sorts of things. And then the last piece of this, as I mentioned before, so we look at documents and information, but we also frequently conduct interviews. And I would say um, almost without exception, conduct interviews. Um, although again, it's case and, and, and situation specific, but the interviews would be uh, for us to gain additional information about what we've seen in the, in the documents, ask about processes, procedures, ask about patterns of behavior and those sorts of things. So um, we typically gather as much information as possible before we conduct interviews with those people who we think may be involved in some sort of misappropriation. So we get as much information as possible. So when we go into those interviews, we um, again, have as much information and can ask as, as targeted a, a question as possible. So uh, the last slide is uh, finalizing and summarizing our findings. So again, we often work through counsel, um, but we would work with counsel to the client in terms of what type of deliverable they would want. So it may be a, an, a verbal oral presentation. It may be a PowerPoint slide deck with high level information, somewhat of an executive summary format, or maybe a detailed report that we would provide to the court or an investigative body. And so we would discuss that with the client or counsel, and, uh, and that would help guide us and inform us as to what type of deliverable we would put together. Um, that work product should really be aligned with the intended reader. So again, it may be a board presentation. It may be inside uh, counsel or general counsel's office or outside counsel, or maybe a um, uh, arbitration hearing or a court hearing. And so again, we would make sure that uh, we conduct our work in a manner that is intended to ultimately be presented in a courtroom, although that may change depending on um, what client and counsel asks us to do. And then in terms of documentation, um, we would maintain uh, information as necessary, depending on the facts of the case, the situation, um, and that would be our support documentation or our work papers that would support our ultimate findings. And so Again, that was meant to be uh, somewhat of a high level overview of the forensic and fraud investigation uh, process and what we look at and how we conduct those. Uh, again, a little bit simplistic if you already do this work for a living, but again, we, we know that we have a lot of attendees today that are executives and business owners and work in uh, various roles in government. And so if you ever need to engage a firm like Armanino or another firm that does this type of work that gives you a little bit of a framework as to how we conduct these uh, types of investigations. And so it looks like we're two minutes before the top of the hour. And so I think we, our timing was, was um, good. Uh, hey, Patrick. Did, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry, there was one question that came in. I wanted to ask of you, how often is the fraud prosecuted and how often is there recovery or partial recovery? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, it really depends. It depends on the entity. It depends on the dollar amount at issue. It depends on. Um, it depends on a lot of factors. So, um, and in terms of recovery, that's another great question. And unfortunately, it's sort of an ambiguous. It depends answer, but that's why we really talk about fraud prevention and mitigation because you would like to prevent the fraud before you have to go through the process of recovering because recovery can be challenging. So. Great. Okay. So it looks like we're almost at the top of the hour and we appreciate everybody's flexibility on our technical difficulty with the polling questions, but Kristen or Ron, any other thoughts or questions? I know we have a lot of questions that have come up in the, in the uh, chat and we can, we'll uh, note those and we can follow up with uh, people on an individual basis, but, Anything else as we wrap up here, Ron or Kristen? No, I have been taking notes of the questions and polling answers, so we'll definitely be able to follow up. Great. Now, we just appreciate everybody's time today and, and again, do apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, hopefully, there's some good information here you can take away, but as Patrick mentioned, uh, both he and I are always here. If uh, you know, Feel free to give us a call or send us an email if you've got a question or, or, or just want to talk about Hey, I think I might have something. Thanks for attending, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.